break it down. Break, break it down. I'm too cheap to do that. Hey, Jay. I don't yeah. see enough yeah. smoke. This week's guest is Jay Lamb, chief perpetrator of the 24 Hours of Lemons racing suit. Hey, I'm dressed in a chicken suit. A little something to our band leader, Corey Jacobs. We're working on getting the sound right on our end, so uh, we could uh, do a little bit of talking. Sitting here in my office waiting for my blind dog to wander in, which he always does, and then he'll fall asleep on my feet and proceed to have horrible gas. How's that? <laughs> That's sort of like what I do to John. That's no good at all. I mean, I've got two dogs, and they're equally terrible. In fact, I just drove back from Santa Cruz last night with the two of them in the back of my station wagon, and it was unbelievable what was going on back there. It was just terrible. Well, your terrible experience is our great sound check. There you go. You know I'm, what? I'll tell you, right? you sound great. Oh, well, thank you. That's that's my special FM voice there. I Yeah, I got that. I got, I got that you turned up the Casey Kasem for us. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jay, what's your title? That's what I'm struggling Chief with. Chief Perpetrator. It is Chief Perpetrator. I didn't want to say that and be incorrect. In the spirit of the love that we like to spread here on Break It Down. I thought I would say uh, thank you to Jay for all the people that are, are amateur racers that have never had a chance to really do this kind of thing. What he's created, this community of racers, is just such a beautiful thing. And uh, another thing about Jay that maybe people don't know is he is officially a mogul because he not only runs the uh, race series but has his own media company. And so, uh, you know, Rupert Murdoch, Jay Lamb, Pierce. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I prefer the term magnate, actually. Can we put and, Baron yeah. in front of that, too? Are you, are you a Baron of any sure. kind? Sure. All right. Yeah, Man. yeah. Well, you know what? I think I think that nowadays that is a purchased title, and I'm too cheap to do that. But, yeah, you can call me an honorary Baron, sure. All right. So give uh, us a little background, Jay. I'm fascinated to hear about the Lemon series as it was born. Tell us about how Lemons got started. Well, you got to go way, way, way back. I mean, I started out in the magazine business from the time I was 15 years old. I was working for car magazines. And in the context of doing that, you go on a lot of really expensive car events, vintage rallies and Pebble Beach and vintage racing and all that kind of stuff. And you get immersed in how most of the car hobby is super expensive. And you get a lot of guys who are just solving all of the problems of getting a car ready with their checkbook. So, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, I was sitting around with Martin Swig, who was the guy who runs, ran the California Melee, and um, we had just finished the California Melee, and Martin was talking about how all of the people who go on that event, which is $6,000 a pop, you know, they really, really know cars, and they're really car guys, and they really understand cars, and I said, you know, Martin, that's true for a lot of them, but there are also some guys here who are just rich guys, and they look at a car, and they say, I want that. They write a big check, and then something breaks, and they dump it off of their mechanic, and they say, fix it, and they write a big check, and that's it. That's the extent of what they know about cars. So I said, you know, if we really want to separate the men from the boys here, it's real simple. You should do an event, a road rally that's 500 miles, and you can't spend more than $500 on the car. That'll show you who really knows how to work on cars and who's really into cars. And we went back and forth, and he didn't really want to do it, and I didn't really want to do it, but we decided we'd do it together. So we did that rally, the double 500. I don't know, four or five, six times. And, and you did that at Altamont? No, no, no. That This was just a, a road rally. It was like a vintage rally, except instead of spending, you know, instead of bringing a half a million dollar car, you could only bring a $500 car. Okay. You got to figure out. The premise was you'd spend 500 bucks on these horrible cars, and then you'd spend the next two days trying to figure out at the side of the road how to make them finish 500 miles on the road. That was That was our theory. And what turned out to happen... It, well, and and the reason I was interested in that, and Martin was interested in that, we've been doing all these events, and it occurred to us, the only time you really had a good time and you really remembered the event was when some horrible thing blew up on your 1951 Porsche 356, and at the side of the road you had to MacGyver a fix that involved, you know, old John Deere parts, barbed wire, and duct tape. At the end of the day, when you're sitting in the bar, you really felt like you'd accomplished something. So we figured these $500 cars trying to go 500 miles on a road rally They'd blow up and you'd get a lot of those stories. What happened is it turns out 
most $500 cars are really good cars, and they weren't breaking enough. So I said at the end of about the fifth event, the double 500, I said, you know, this is too easy. We got to make it harder. We got to do a road race with this thing. We got to do an endurance race with $500 cars. At which point Martin said, man, you are on your goddamn own. I want no part of that. If you're dumb enough to do that, more power to you, but I don't want any part of it. This um, is okay, so but there it. isn't enough stuff breaking. Exactly. I don't yeah, see enough exactly. smoke for the, for this event to be cool. Yeah, exactly. And so the idea of taking the same concept but putting it on a racetrack for an endurance race, it just seemed obvious to me that you were going to get a whole lot more explosions and people would have to figure out how to get these cars, you know, fixed and, and back out there. So, um, so I wound up doing that one myself. I mean, Martin was great with advice and stuff like that, but he thought that was, he thought that was a bit too much to take, uh, to take on. So I did that one myself and the idea was going to be one, one event, you know, it was going to be for me and the 12 other people eating lunch around the table as we were having this discussion. And that was going to be it. It was just going to sort of be a party. I really thought after two hours, every single car was going to have blown up terminally. And for the next 22 hours, we would be sitting in a bar somewhere having cocktails. I mean, it didn't work out that way. The cars actually, $500 cars can actually do it. I mean, they can actually run an endurance race. So it really starts at the selection process. Because if you're talking to a bunch of car guys, and you first the first challenge issued is you need to get a $500 car that's going to do something for you. There is the first point of separation between the men and the boys. Because the men are going to go, okay. Let's see what I can dig up for 500 bucks and then really kind of come up with something that's decent. And of course, to make the event more masculine, <laughs> you got to introduce more opportunity for adversity, right? So you got to, you got to, yeah, you, you have to complicate everybody's life because otherwise, what have you accomplished? Right, right. Yeah, easy's not fun. How long ago was that, Jay? Eight years ago. Eight years? That's it? Yeah, eight, eight years. God, it seems like a it seems like a long time to me. Well, I'm sure it seems like a long time because you've gotten a lot done in those eight years. I mean, this lemons movement has just mushroomed. How many racers do we have on the books now, Jay? Uh, well, there's there's about thirty thousand names in the database of people who have signed up. Um, a lot of those are dupe. You know, one guy doesn't figure out how to do it, so he signs up eighteen different times for eighteen different races. Realistically, I mean, right now this year we'll do about 9,000 individuals through Lemons Races. And how many teams do you think that represents? That's about 3,000 teams, somewhere between two and 3,000 teams. And, and team, I know there's a lot of cross-pollinating really in the community and, you know, guys are, guys are participating on more than one team and, and trading teammates and stuff like that. So you yeah, think 3,000 so teams with a car mm -hmm. that could possibly enter an event. And yes. I understand that your most recent event, you broke a record. Well, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, and I don't know how they count such things, but according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the previous record for the largest endurance race was 175 cars. And what that means is all the cars start the race at the same time. Um, you know, it's on a closed course. It's an endurance race in the sense that Europeans understand that sport, which is sports car racing over a long period, you know, tw uh, 4, 12, 24 hours. Right. Um, that's how they defined it. So we decided, well, hell, we do that all the time. So we did 200 and, well, 216 cars were on the track at the start for the last Thunderdale race, which, you know, Guinness is in the process of certifying it right now, but it looks like they're not going to have any problem with calling that a record. Wow. That's a record with a uh, pretty decent margin. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, it seems it does seem pretty comfortable, but you never know what happens. You send this giant stack of documents off to London, and uh, God only knows, you know, uh, what's going to happen at that point. So we're waiting to see. We're supposed to hear back in a week or two more um, whether they're whether they're going to certify the thing. But I'm pretty sure that that uh, that's going to get us the record. What is For, a normal you know, volume of racers? Get you a cup of coffee. Yeah. What is it? What? <laughs> right. Well, you know, being a record holder is being a record holder, man. You got to count it. So well, what? I'm, already, I'm already a record holder, and and I'll tell you, it's real. So about 20 years ago, when I was working for car magazines, I was running Sports Car International, a couple other magazines at the time. I get a call from Saab, and they say, "Hey, man, we need you to come to Talladega and do this um this FIA World Speed Record Endurance deal." And I go, "Well, why me? I'm I'm a terrible driver." Uh, you know, what the hell do I have to do with it? They said, well, it goes on for three weeks, 
and we're just desperate. We need like 500 guys to drive these cars in this three week long endurance thing to set all these records. So I said, yeah, fine. So I went and between, you know, all the guys driving, we set, I personally was involved in nine of these FIA records and they still stand. And you know, the most amazing thing is you go into something like that thinking, oh man, this is going to be great. I'm going to be famous. And you do it. And then absolutely nothing changes in your life and nobody gives a goddamn about it. And that's sort of the end of it. So I'm not expecting the Guinness World Record to change much of anything. Okay. What What is a normal race volume, though, if if, uh, if that was a record? Uh, on the Lemon Series, what do you typically see? Yeah, we average, about a, we average about 100 cars per race. And that's anywhere from, you know, a high of a couple of hundred at some races to some races are 28, 35 cars, something like that. So it's all over the map. The average is about 100. Holy moly, what do you think made Thunder Hill such a whopping success? Well, it's a big track, and we were able to accept all the cars that applied. Mo you know, most racetracks, you get 250 applications, but the track can only hold 180 cars, or the okay. pack can only hold 180 cars. Thunder Hill just did this expansion. They're the longest, uh, in terms of distance, they're the longest road racing track in the country now, uh, five miles, and they've got these two huge paddocks. So we were able to take, you know, every every one of the 300 applications, we were able to say, okay, you're accepted. And of those 240-something, we're able to get their act together and show up. And then of those, you know, 30 or whatever that is, 20, 25, 30, couldn't quite make the car run for the start. So they were in the paddock while the 216 were circulating around. There were even cars when, you, uh, when you're all lined up to start, Jay's out there being Jay and waving his arms and everything, being important. And there were cars... <laughs> That couldn't answer the bell. They're lined up. They got out there. They started and, and got in line and quit. Yeah, right wow. and, they're, and they're dead, and there's 150 cars stuck behind them yes. as they're trying to start their stupid RX-7. Oh, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, hilarious. you knew that was going to happen, and so we stayed, to, you know, we staged two or three push trucks at the back of that path to try to clear them off, but... Uh, hey, these are five hundred dollar cars, right? So there's a lot of them are going to crap out. Yeah, some something like that's going to happen. But that's adversity. That's not even a good story. I mean, you want it, you want to yeah. go down in flames. It's the beginning of yeah. a good story, though. Yeah, yeah. Now that's that. That's just that's just weak adversity. Right. Exactly. That's yeah. petering out. Exactly. Yeah. No pun intended. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. where where do you see the race series going from here? I mean, you. Obviously, the popularity is going through the roof, and hopefully that um, that continues. And there's no reason. Now, I'm a casual observer. Pete, of course, is on the circuit. Yeah. But yeah. as a casual observer, man, it's a great atmosphere. It's a big party. It's a bunch of car guys and girls getting together. And surprising number of females involved, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, I mean, it's about a third... Uh, women involved, which is really extraordinary for motorsports. And I'll tell you the thing about maybe it's the motorsports factor, the, the third that represents the female population, pretty good representation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, mean, I, it, I don't know where the thing is going. I mean, this was never supposed to happen, and every day I wake up and I'm surprised that people are still showing up for these dumb things. So I got, I really have no idea. And if you had asked me eight years ago, you know, and this thing really, like I said, this was supposed to be a one-time party. And if you had said to me eight years ago, well, this is going to take over your life and this is going to take over your career and all you're going to be doing is, is doing these ridiculous car races, you know, for the next eight years, I would have said that was the most implausible thing I'd ever heard in my life. So, you know, what happens a year from now, five years from now, I don't have the slightest damn idea. I'm We're kind of holding on by our fingernails just trying to make sure that everybody who signs up you know, gets in, gets safety checked, has a good time, you know, uh, all the pieces are in place. Thinking ahead, boy, that that's a whole nother job. I don't know if I'm prepared for that. Jay, not only do they show up, uh, there's there's other series that are now come up. The market is that strong to support yeah. it. It's yeah, insane. Yeah, no, there, there's this constant stream of, of, well, I mean, copycats, really. Um, and some come and some go and some stick around. It You know, it turns out that we fell ass backward into this thing that people really, really wanted to do. I mean, there was this big desire for people to get out on the track who were scared away by the existing race series for whatever reason. But, I mean, I didn't know that. I don't think anybody knew that. We just we just stumbled into it. Who could see it coming? Yeah, not me. So, Jay, what do you do with uh, the drivers and the teams that, 
let's let's use it for example like the Cerveza team. They dominate. Yeah. yeah. They go out and they win race after race after race. Now in the old days, likely to get their car smashed. That doesn't happen anymore. What do you yeah. do with a team like that that's clearly excellent and there's no there's no X class to go up to? What yeah. do you do you do anything? What do you do? Well, I think you do the best that you can do to make sure that they are following the rules that the rules are laid out. Um and then if they continue to be excellent, I mean, you congratulate them on being excellent. You know, the truth with those guys, and there are just a couple of other teams in that same league, and the truth is they understand the problem. The problem in endurance racing, in all racing, but particularly in endurance racing, it is 85% an organization problem, and it's 10% a driving problem, and it's 5% a hardware problem. And the vast majority of people who come to our race and any race to participate, they don't understand that. They think that it's 90% a hardware problem. The hardware is absolutely the least of it. And Cerveza understands that. They understand that the way you win an endurance race is everybody's got their shit together. All of the paperwork is good. So when the guy goes out of the track, he's already got his wristband. They know to the lap how many laps they can get out of each tank before they got to pull over and stop. They understand that at any given corner, there's four guys going into a corner. They understand there's no margin for them sticking their nose in there. They can pass them, you know, the next lap or the lap after that. If they stick their nose in there trying to be heroes, they're going to get bumped. They're going to get a penalty. They're going to come in. They're going to lose the race. So the Cerveza guys, and as I say, a handful of others, have really figured out this is an organizational problem. You got to know where your tools are. You got to know where your fuel stops are. You got to know when you come in with an issue, you got to know where is that part that I got to swap out and put right back in so I'm not running around like a chicken in the paddock for 20 minutes. They understand the organizational side of it. And that's why they do so well. And I just, I just can't see punishing those guys for solving the problem. I mean, they really have looked at the problem, understood it and solved it. If they were cheating in some kind of obvious way, that's really different. And there are a lot of teams that, you know, we penalize them for cheating so often that they just like, well, we can't figure this problem out. We're going somewhere else. And that's great. You want those guys to go somewhere else. But there are a few teams that have just figured out the problem. And, and if they're figuring it out honestly, that's racing. I mean, you know, no, nobody looked at Mario Andretti when he was winning the F1 World Championship in the 70s and said, well, that guy's too good. What are we going to do about that? I mean, racing is about solving the problem, and they've solved it. That's a microcosm of life, man. Yeah. It is. I mean, it, if it I could really just is. get my own shit together half the time. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is. You know what and else that's is? That's why a lot of people like racing. I mean, racing represents itself, just as you say, as a microcosm of, of life. I mean, it's, it's, it's a clearer example because the rules are written out. You know when the thing's going to happen. You know what you got to do. But yeah, you got to get your shit together. And and those guys not only uh, do it well, they don't seem to break a sweat doing it when they're there. No, I no, mean they they make it look easy, don't they? Yeah, and, and I think a lot of that is because they know they've got their they got their asses covered on the little stuff. They're not worrying. You know, the day before the race, they're not putting new parts in the engine. I mean, they knew four months in advance. Hey, this day is coming up. We got to do the da 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 to get this thing ready. And they're done far in advance, so they're just they're relaxed. They don't have a lot to worry about. I see so many holes in my own life as you make these <laughs> statements. I mean, you're just describing, you know, how these guys win races, and it just I can't help but think this is just how you win. This is just yeah. winning. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is, and and isn't it amazing that that a lot of guys who who figured out how to win, it does make it look easy. It, it it's like when you were in school. And you, and I mean, this is me, this is my experience. When you're in school and you spend four times as much energy trying to figure out how to pass a class without doing the assignments, if you just do the assignments, it's right. so easy. And, and I think that applies to racing and it applies to life. I feel, Jay, like we just met, but you've known me all my life. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> Pull your head out of your ass and get to work, kid. Right. Just do the work for crying out loud. Yeah. Quit complaining. Wow, who knew that a uh, conversation about lemons racing was going to make me sit and contemplate my own? Now I feel like I'm going to go into a cave and sit Indian style or in the yoga position or whatever and stare out a, into the... Yeah. I see a whole new team theme coming for you. Yeah. Now, yeah, so speaking of team themes, you have to love what Speedy Cop does for your brand. Oh. That guy's incredible. 
No, that that guy that guy is absolutely incredible. And in fact, I just bought his Camaro because I just loved it so much. I sort of wanted to have it around here. It's you bought the down. upside down Camaro? Yeah, yeah, I bought it. It's out in the garage. It's here at uh, Sonoma right now. All right. Well, we have a bevy of listeners who have no idea what we're talking about. So just to I'll brief, tell, brief those. Yeah, and I'll tell them. So 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 this guy Speedy Cup, who is a fabulous fabricator and very creative and just generally a complete whack job. He builds these incredible art cars is really what they are. And then he makes them into competitive race cars. And one of them, he took a late seventies Ford Festive, a little mini car and cut all the external body panels off. And then he took a 1980 something Camaro and cut all the guts out of it, flipped the Camaro body upside down and attached it really well to the Festiva body. So what you've got driving down the street looks like this completely upside down car shooting down the road. It is absolutely fantastic. And he did it so well that every lap, every time that thing came around, the first time I saw it, you know, you're thinking in your mind, hey, I know that this upside down car is coming. I know it's not really a guy who's flipped and sliding on the track. So it's going to be okay. And then you'd see it and you go, oh my God. It's it's that it's upside down. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. So what so we're gonna I'm do is to... we'll put a picture of the upside down Camaro on uh, on our website for the listeners to click on. But I also want them to go check out wherever you're housing your stuff. So where can our listeners go to find your picture of the upside down Camaro? Twenty four hours of lemons dot com. Two four hours of lemons dot com. There's a whole bunch of galleries on that site. There's pictures of the Camaro there. Of course. All of Speedy Cop stuff, the airplane car, the upside-down Camaro, the family truckster, all of those things. He's got his own website, speedycop.com, and there's fabulous pictures of all of that stuff. So he is the best creator, fabricator of that kind of stuff I think I've ever seen. The guy is just, he's just a nutcase. Yeah. And it comes out in this fabulous expression of these great art cars. And for for our civilian listeners out there, Speedy Cop got his name because he drives race cars and he's a police officer. Yeah, yeah, he's a U.S. Park Police sergeant. He's not only a police officer; he's actually he's a very successful career police officer. And then you see this guy doing this insane stuff, and you think, God, how can they keep employing this guy? Clearly, he's got a couple of screws loose. But in his in his day job, he's extremely successful professional. Well, not only does he have a couple of screws loose in his pursuits, and that's obvious, but the amount of work that goes into each one of these pieces, yeah. clearly yeah. he spends hours and out, countless hours. Oh, yeah. T- tens of thousands of hours going into these things. And I just, you know, I was I was back in Washington, D.C. where he lived a couple of months ago, and I visited his house slash shop, and it's like Santa's workshop. Is I mean, it more house back- or more shop? It's more shop than house, definitely. Wow. You go back there, there's 10 guys kind of all running around with grinders and welders and multi-testers, and they're all swarmed over some horrible piece of junk that he's turning into something. So he's got, he's got these guys who kind of follow in, in, uh, follow the circus with him. And why and wouldn't you? Let's face things. it. You know, when you find Dr. Frankenstein and he's really doing these outlandish things, the best thing you can do to feed your own hobby is to hit your star to his wagon, as the old saying goes. Yeah. And, and he's doing, I mean, just revolutionary stuff. So again, for the casual listener, one of the things about the Lemons Racing Circuit is that you're not just about sticking a $500 car on the track and driving it around, but but you're also challenging guys to bring a $500 car, and you kind of have to have a sense of humor to just take on the endeavor. So these guys are working in their, you know, in their workshops, pouring their hearts into these cars. At some point, you got to say, "I'm going to make my car look like a can of spam." And you got all these theme cars with such outlandish things going on. You have to be encouraging that. Oh yeah, no, I mean, th- there's there's two pieces to that. One is most races. They take the field based on who's the fastest. They take the 33 fastest cars and they let them race. We got no interest in that. We take all the people who want to race and we look at who is going to be the most entertaining to have around for a whole weekend. And that's the guys that we let in. And the guys who say, the guys whose application says, we are four guys and we love to race and we will bring a Honda. Who cares? You know, right. that's a lottery. The guy who says, we are four guys, and we are going to do a perfect nuts and bolts replica of the family truckster from vacation. They're in. So yes. there's competition to make the field. you got to impress us that you're going to do something that's going to be amusing and fun to hang out with you guys. 
And the other piece is, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of these guys, we brought more people into wheel to wheel racing than, you know, probably any other series in the last 30, 40 years. And the reason is there's 4 million car fans in this country. The vast majority of them, 99.9%, they look at car racing and they say, you know, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to screw up. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, they're going to yell at me. I'm going to be in the wrong place. Our deal, we say to these guys, look, this is just for fun. And if you're dressed up in a chicken suit and you screw up, you can always shrug your soul shoulders and say, hey, I'm dressed in a chicken suit. You know, I'm just kidding around. So it gives people a way to understand you're not all going to be Cerveza. You're not all going to win the race. Everybody's going to make mistakes. It, I, I think the humor is a way that people express, hey, we know that we're just having a good time here. We're not taking it that seriously. So if something, you know, if we do a, if we do something wrong, we make a mistake, that's okay. That's not really what we're here for. Jay, we're kindred spirits, brother, because you just referenced the chicken soup. Yeah. <laughs> that, to me, is, is the makings it, of a successful of a symbol, podcast. Uh, if we can get a guest on here to tell an interesting story and somehow he weaves in a chicken suit, my, and that's a winner. Yeah. Well, the, the chicken suit, as I say, that that is really representative of what we are doing at 24 Hours of Lemons. Any idiot can show up for a car race, but an idiot who shows up for a car race and wears a chicken suit all weekend, that's our kind of idiot. That's right. That's right. That's right. Jay, I, I think our next, uh, uh, the Cannonball Bandit's next theme is likely to be naked and afraid. Well, you know what? You already have that with Montoya. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most yeah. of the time. Yeah. Or, or naked and not nearly afraid enough, is I think. <laughs> naked naked, and, naked and striking fear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So exactly. I know you have a hundred favorites, man, and there's been all kinds of crazy things that have crossed your, your path uh, on the, in the eight years that you've been doing this, but give us four or five of just the most outlandish, crazy themes that you've embraced in the eight well, years you've been doing it. I mean, I was just thinking about this today, talking to somebody else this morning, and, and you know, the team that really started top-notch themes was Eyesore, and they started about five, six years ago. They they turned their Miata into an Elvis Cadillac. They turned their CRX into a fantastic Pimpmobile. They had full costumes. I mean, they really set the pace. So I'd say, like, the Eyesore, the Eyesore CRX Pimp costume, they turned it into, you know, a 72 Eldorado. That was, that was fabulous. I think Jeff's, Jeff Block, Speedy Cops, you know, kind of everything he's done has been great. The airplane is the most mind blowing thing I've ever seen. Incredible. He took a, he took a mid eighties Toyota van, cut it off at the floor pan, grafted on a late fifties Cessna twin engine fuselage and raced that thing. And that was spectacular. Um, that's unbelievable. Yeah, that, that was just incredible. You know, Spank Spangler has done a, a bunch of really amazing things. He's got this Austin Mini Moat chassis, basically, and he converted it into a pretty convincing Caterpillar Earth Mover. That was spectacular. Wow. Uh, you know, it, the list just goes on and on and on. You, you can't even start on something like that because there's 70 cars that all belong in that, in that realm. You sort of just got to roll through all the galleries and every, Every race, you see something else. It's like, how the hell the hell did they do that, and why the hell did they do it? Yeah, I'm so glad when I look through those galleries that somebody had the wherewithal to capture all of that. Yeah. Because half the time, Pete and I are doing anything. After we're done, we go, man, that was terrific. That was hilarious. That was whatever. Did you take a picture? No. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Well, there's a, there is a website that has a photograph at least one of every single car that has ever gotten onto the track in a lemons race. Wow. And that's Judge Phil, who travels around with us to pretty much every race. He's the chief justice. He uh, assesses whether people spent too much money on the car, and then he assesses penalties in the pits when they screw up on track. His website, which is murleymartin.com, M-U-R-I-L-E-E Martin, all one word, dot com, has got uh, an Uber gallery, it's called. You can see a picture of every single Lemons car that ever got on the track there. Wow. Yeah. That's that, a great that's catalog. dedication right there. Yeah. Hey, so I heard on the Adam Carolla podcast that you had a policy, and I understand from Pete that you don't do it anymore, but you used to just take a car that if you think broke the rule, uh, broke the $500 rule, you would just destroy the car. For, well, like, so, like to enjoy. so many things, like so many things you hear on the internet, that's not true. Oh. That, that, that's not true. That's a great story. 
it, it is a great story, and in a way I wish it were true, but it's not. We used to do a thing where every team would get a ballot, and they could the, all the teams could vote on one car that they thought the team was such pricks, and they were so antithetical to the spirit of what we were doing that their car ought to be crushed. And we did that for about the first, I don't know, 15, 16 races, and it worked really well because what it did is it set the tone and it, it let people who are already in the racing community understand, look, this is not a place where you're going to come and you're going to beat up on other people who don't know how to race that well. That's not what this is for. This is beer league, and we do not want uh, Ty Cobb showing up and spiking our catcher. We're not into that. So we did that for the first, you know, dozen or dozen or so races, whatever it was. And that really got the message across pretty clearly. And those guys started to understand either don't come, which is fine, or if you do come, be nice. You know, this is not about going after the guy next to you with a tire iron in the pits. We are not into that shit. So once that message got across, what happened is you you sort of had run out of cars that, that teams really had a reason to crush, and they were starting to vote for people who were just doing well. As soon as that happened, we said, all right, th this has outlived its usefulness. So we don't do that. What we do do, and what we will always do is, you know, the first order of business on this deal is not to hurt anybody. And you're going out there and you're putting a lot of cars on the track in a very chaotic environment. And when people start screwing up, they drive off the track, they run into other cars, they lose control of their car. When they start screwing up like that, that's the first warning that they're going to have an issue. And most of the time, 9,999 times out of 10,000, when they screw up like that, nothing happens. They don't hit anything. They don't hit anybody. They don't hurt anybody. But one time in 10,000, they do. So we have that's a That's all you need. Then that's all you need, exactly. So we have a real interest in making sure that you stop those problems way before the chain of events causes some, or, you know, before the, the chain of events is likely to cause an injury. So in that context, if somebody screws up like that, we'll black flag them, we'll bring them in, we'll make them do something embarrassing and time-consuming as an incentive not to screw up. And it's not really because making them, you know, uh, yeah, making them eat disgusting food or sing the national anthem. It's not because that's fun, though it is. It's really because the point, the point is there are certain careless and overly aggressive behaviors that if you let them go unchecked, sooner or later, someone's going to get hurt. Right. So um, it's just a great way that you're curtailing the dangerous behaviors because exactly. for anybody who's listening, exactly. who thinks that this, I mean, we're talking about theme cars and Cessna fuselages and, and, and such. That doesn't that doesn't mean that we're talking about a parade of jalopies. If somebody right. goes out there and carelessly makes a mistake, they're making a mistake at a hundred miles an hour. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's not, a, and it's you know, and it's not a demolition derby. This is a non-contact sport. Um, and yeah, you've got you've got guys going a buck fifty at some of these tracks in cars like Montoya's. You're Supra. welcome. Um, you cannot afford to let that get out of control. Right. It's dangerous enough. You know, it's it's like skiing. There's always an element of danger, and people do get hurt. And, you know, we've been very lucky with that so far, but that's just been luck. It, it, it is, it, it's an extreme sport. It is, and there's dangers there. But the more you can do to try to um, reduce the risks and cut down the chances of something bad happening, the better for everybody. Jay, I, I would say it's it's more than luck. You guys do a great job. And, um, you know, one thing that goes in our favor when we race is there's a tremendous amount of uh, safety equipment. And, and that's not included in the $500 for, for the right. listeners who don't right. understand that. Right. Roll right. cages, fire suits. We have a fire suppression system in the Supra. Yeah. And so uh, uh, you are literally safer in that race car than you are on the freeway. And there's no intersections. There's no... There's yeah. no left turn that is, you know, people coming towards you. So you're all going in the same direction. So in a lot of ways, it's safer on the track. And, Jay, I think you'll, you'll appreciate this. It's safer on the track than it is in the paddock. And every time I see someone get hurt and an ambulance shows up, which is very rare, the accident is at five miles an hour or less. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I, I, think that's, I think that's right. It's definitely safer on the track than, than in the paddock. But that said, you know, even driving to work, there's a certain element of risk, and and we are talking about thousands of people acquiring literally millions of miles, 
it adds up. It adds up. And and I when I say that we're lucky, I'm not I'm not just um, you know soft pedaling the efforts. We work really hard to try to make this as safe as we can, and we make a lot of sacrifices in terms of places we could go, money we could earn, customers we could have. We make a lot of sacrifices in that because what we're trying to do first and foremost is be able to sleep at night because we're not worried about somebody, you know, wiping themselves out. That said, you know, it's a chaotic environment. And as I said, just like a ski resort, you can do everything you can do and you try to do the very best you can do. But, you know, sooner or later, those events are all going to line up in a bad way. It's just inevitable. And you look at any motorsport and it deals with that. Um, how you deal with that is a big part of how you make something like this self-sustaining. Yeah, and you use the word luck, but I'll use the word foresight. Well, it's a, it's a lot of both. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of both. You know, when you see somebody who needs medical attention, it's likely because they fell off the trailer trying to reach for a T-shirt or something. It's but, it's the crazy things you can't even predict. Yeah, We had yeah. an incident at Button Willow, and it, less than five miles an hour, and someone gets hurt. You, you just, there's... So many variables, something's going to get you. And they do a great job at reducing that risk. So, yeah, it's just the injuries that happen because there's a gathering of several hundred people. Right. So here's just my civilian curiosity. You're uh, the chief perpetrator for the 24 Hours of Lemons. What do you drive day to day? Huh. Well, you know, that's an ever-shifting target. Right now, uh, my everyday driver, I've got a 15-year-old Porsche 911 that I love to death that I bought, I bought about a year and a half ago from the original owner. It had no miles on it, and it was so goddamn cheap that I thought there's got to be a catch here. I mean, nobody wants these things. It's a water-cooled 996. Nobody wants them. And I bought it. I'd never owned a rear-engine Porsche before, and I just love it. So I drive that every day. I've got uh, my wife has a BMW wagon, and we run the dogs around in that. And I have – I just sold – my 240Z and I just sold my Alpha GTV race car. I bought a 1960 Kellison J4 Experimental Coupe, which right now is in my garage here in San Francisco. And I'm literally, as we're talking, waiting for a couple of guys to show up from the restoration shop, pick it up and flatbed it back to Danville. It needs, I mean, it's a running, driving, 1960 low production car but it kind of needs everything to be made right. It drives like a 1960 low production car and it wow. is awful. It is terrible. I don't it's even know what that all, is. It's got all first generation Corvette running gear, including brakes and front suspension, which is just unspeakably bad. So we're going to spend about a year making it really right and usable. And then, you know, maybe that's going to be my everyday car. We're in Danville and you're in San Francisco. Um, Why are we Skyping? Well, I, that I, that I can't answer. The shop, you know, um, you know the Model T GT, right? Yes. That's, uh, Fish and Dave Shibley. Uh, they're gonna be, they're gonna be doing my Kellison. They're coming to pick up the car right now. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Hey, so, uh, I'm told, uh, by a couple of people that you have said that the Tesla is the best car that you've ever experienced. Yeah. 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 Can you expand it, upon that? You know, sh shocking. <laughs> I, I have been, I was a professional automotive journalist at a, you know, honestly at a pretty high level for 25 years, 30 years. Um, and I've driven just about everything that there is out there. And I have owned a lot of really expensive and nice collectible stuff. And I've ridden in a lot of current stuff. You know, I've really been in it and I got into this Tesla P85 S plus and it is immediately clear in that car. I've never driven one before. It's immediately clear that it is a different and better way to solve the problem of moving your ass around. You know, you get in, you get into a normal car, like let's say an S class Mercedes, current S class, and it's pretty phenomenal. And you think, well, it's not going to get much better than this. But then you get into the Tesla and you say, oh, well, hold on a minute. This idea of having all of these separate really heavy metal masses spread out throughout the package and a big heavy thing of liquid in the back. So every time you change direction, you feel all of those masses moving around different axes. That's fucked up. That's no good at all. You know, the, t the Tesla, it just is immediately obvious that it's a better way to solve the problem. 
all your weight is right down on the floor so everything rotates around a single axis or it feels that way. Um, you don't have all those second and third order vibrations coming through the powertrain and you really pick that up in a normal car. You don't realize it because every car you've been in feels that way. But then as soon as you're in a car that doesn't have that, you're like, oh yeah, that's terrible. So I'm not saying that particular car, I mean, I'm not going to buy one. I'm not saying that particular <laughs> car is, is the greatest development ever, but it really makes it obvious that that is a much better way to move people around the world. It's just, it's smoother, it's simpler, there's a lot less monkey motion going on, um, it steers better, it stops better. That Tesla easily, easily will outhandle my Porsche. I mean, hands down. Wow. Um, and it's got room for five big, fat, cigar-chomping dudes. So, it's a pretty sweet car. You know, that is the that is an amazing way to describe the difference because everybody says, oh, yeah, it's quick, it's cool, it's, you know. But the uh, very descriptive way that you told us about how movement happens in a motor vehicle, things that things that I don't ever think about, yeah, um, that that painted a picture of the difference. Now, okay, all those things said, what what's stopping you from buying one? It's too much money. I can't afford that. Yeah. It's <laughs> like a hundred and something thousand dollars. I mean, it, it if I were the kind of guy who could have a hundred and something thousand dollar car, I would totally buy one. But I mean, I'm not that guy, unfortunately. Yeah. Unless you want to buy it for me. Uh, we're not that guy either. Yeah. <laughs> we are collectively not that guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's really unfortunate. I mean, no, it, it was really an eye-opener driving that thing. And I know a lot of guys, you know, my colleagues in the car magazine business, they hate that car because it, they see it as a threat to this uh, type of car that they've grown up with and loved their whole lives. And I just don't see it that way. I mean, I think it's it's just a quantum leap ahead of how you solve that problem. But I think it, there's no reason that that can't be just as interesting and fun and compelling as doing a car with gasoline. There's no reason at all. Well, some of that is is a uh, fear of job security. You know? Yeah. So it, it's one of those things where let's say somebody comes through and you mentioned the Cerveza team that if everybody suddenly solves the problem, the driving of a $500 car for 24 hours no longer in introduces yeah. the opportunity for all that adversity that we love so much, suddenly it's, it's less interesting. And so maybe yeah. there's just yeah. guys no, in the I car mean, magazine business who are like, well, you just made it less interesting. No, I think that's right. And I think that's a short view because you get a world where there's going to be 300 different full electric cars and there's going to be as much variation between those things and as much stuff that's worthy of talking about and arguing about. You know, the other thing about the Tesla that I thought was fascinating is that clearly the people who designed it, engineered it, and assembled it are top-notch. They're 18 people. It is a made-in-America car, which is fascinating because it really shows you the people who are doing those same roles at other car manufacturers, and particularly American car manufacturers, pretty clearly they're not 18 guys. And when you think about it, you know, if you're at the top of your class from an engineering school or an electrical, you know, electrical engineering program or whatever it is, who are you going to work for? General Motors? Hell no. You're going to work for Apple or you're going to work for Google or maybe you're going to work for Tesla. Right. I, I think what we're seeing now, what that car made me understand is that we've come to a place in our culture where cars are so disrespected. Taken for um, granted. It's taken for granted and, and nobody's really that passionate about it who's young and coming up into the workforce that the people who are working for car companies, they're just not top-flight people as a rule. I mean, sure, there are some, but generally you're getting the guys who, you know, the real heavy hitters, they're working for, they're working on Wall Street or they're working for a tech company. They're not working for car manufacturers anymore. And so you're dealing with these products that are probably not being made by the, the best guys and the smartest guys and the most organized guys, whereas the Tesla, I think they must have been able to cherry-pick mostly really top-flight smart guys, and it really shows in the package. Yeah, being able to uh, take those designers that, that are good, that are 18 members at GM or Ford or whatever, and say, listen, we're knocking the paradigms down. You actually can make a difference here. Yeah. Will you come and work? That has got to resonate with yeah. those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, I think with, with the established car makers, there's just too much inertia for for kind of the dysfunctional organization as it is. I mean, look at, look at Saturn. That was what, the, that was what Roger Smith was trying to do when they started Saturn. And it just didn't work. There was no way that General Motors could stop being General Motors. 
And I think that's, I, I don't know how, if you're General Motors or Ford, I don't know how you get out from under that. That's just a legacy curse that I don't know how you solve that. Yeah, you, you, you solve it by becoming obsolete and uh, yeah. Tesla, Tesla ends up taking the market share. Yeah. And you yeah. cannot yeah. stop it. Yeah. You know, at yeah. some point everything expires. And, and yeah. I hate to say that around, uh, about something as uh, ingrained in our society as the big three, but they have just become behemoths. They can't support their own weight yeah. anymore. I yeah. don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, there are changes afoot and there are good things happening now in now, Detroit. I, I've, I mean, been, I've been in this business long enough. You know, I, I've lived through seven rebirths of General Motors and, and every single time, you know, the car magazines all say, Oh, they, they got to figure it out. They've turned the corner. They're this time it's different. Now. And yeah, this time it's different. Well, you know what? It's never different. I heard, I, I was around to hear that about the Pinto, about the X car, about the Lumina, about the Cavalier, about the, the, what's the, what, what's the horrible thing that replaced the Cavalier that now won't shut off or shuts off too many? What the hell is that thing? I mean, every eight years you get that song and dance. And you know what? It's never right. They're always, they've always been a couple of steps behind and it's heartbreaking, but that's just plain the fact. Now, what's been really interesting to me is to watch the Japanese go through the same cycle. Oh, you know, Toyota, in my experience, has really kind of become the new General Motors, which has been sort of shocking to watch. But they've got a lot of the same problems now. Well, we've gotten to a point in our country and in our expectations in, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives that Detroit is just not cool. Yeah. And if yeah. you're, like you said, if you're a top flight guy and you're going to change the world with your horsepower in the brain department, you're not going to move to shitty Detroit. Yeah. yeah. Who would yeah. do that? Yeah. Well, uh, that's absolutely true. Although I, I believe that the, I believe that's the result, not the cause. I believe the cause is, you know, General, General Motors was Apple in the 1950s. It was Apple. Yeah. And I think, I think what General Motors learned in the sixties was, they could make a lot of money by underestimating the intelligence and the taste of their customer base. I mean, they learned in the 60s, you can make cars that are not not really very good. You know they're not really very good, but people will pay a lot of money for them. Like the GTO is a classic example where General Motors had known for a really long time, if you put too big an engine into a car, you make a really crappy car. It doesn't steer right. It doesn't stop right. It's got cooling problems. It's got noise problems. It's no fun to drive. Well... John Lurin came along and he did it anyway and he showed, hey, yeah, that's true, but you know what? We're making 30% more profit on this thing and it's all parts that we already had. You know, and I think SUVs were the same thing. They learned that people will give them a lot of money for kind of a crappy product and that became their mantra. They, they started to say, how can we build, you know, what's the crappiest car we can build before we have to charge less? rather than what's the best car we can build before we have to charge more. And there it and, is, right there. And, and I think I think everything that's happened in the last 30 years of Detroit follows out of that mindset. That's yeah. my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's crystal clear now that you put it that way. It's, it's absolutely crystal clear. And and like you said, the tech tech companies that are, uh, you know, that are prevailing have the opposite mindset. How can yeah. we just dazzle? How can we yeah. create an experience that's completely different and undeniable? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, well, there we are. Yeah. So, hey, know. man, just to circle back, I think what you're part. doing in 24 Hours of Lemons is creating an experience for everybody, from the spectator to the, to the driver to everybody on the team to the family members they drag out. That's just undeniable. Well... I wouldn't say that we're trying to dazzle. I certainly wouldn't say that. <laughs> You don't but, think that taking a Camaro and flipping it upside down is, is an attempt I, to dazzle? I think you're confusing dazzle and horrify. Okay. Uh, but uh, Back to the but, Montoya naked reference. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, you know, as, as I say, we have very much by accident, we have sort of created this community where people feel comfortable um, really expressing themselves kind of out and proud. And uh, that's great. I mean, that really makes this thing worth doing. Hey, with that said, Jay, I wanted to uh, bring up, uh, before the uh, race out at Sears Point, I think we're going to open up a little bit of a matrix that I'm going to call the Turn Turner Imminent Failure Matrix. And we're going to yeah. uh, nominate cars and and uh, laps and sell it kind of like a Super Bowl thing. Obviously, most of the money going to Alex's lemonade stand. 
But um, I need to know if you want in, and we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna put our car because our car tends to fail. Put the Calmero and some of Tony Tartita's cars on there. And uh, uh, if you're interested, I'll hit you up on, offline. But uh, oh yeah, I'm totally in. Yeah, so this I, is like you know, a pool. I can nail that. It's a pool. It's a pool. That yeah. Instead of you know what what's the score going to be right. in the in the end of the first yes. quarter? It's uh, how many laps is this car going to go? When's right. it going to die? Before it dies. Yeah. So so you can pick your car, and then and then like the first value you can get is zero. You know, this uh-huh. car will not take the green flag on Saturday totally, morning. Totally, I am totally going to dominate that pool. <laughs> yes, and we're going to wait it so the early laps. You know, you get a smaller bracket of laps, right? And later on, like so, get, zero to five, yeah, it might, might be exactly. the lower, and then uh, uh, and then the bracket will get wider, yeah, you get wider twenty-five you lap brackets. So yeah, so all right, so I'll hit you up for sure offline, and uh, and uh, we'll get this thing going around. And oh, totally in. Aaron hey, Sloman hey. and his Calmero are in as well. Well, Pete brought it up, but uh, talk to us about Alex's lemonade stand. So we do. Every race has an official charity, and one of the one of the most uh, frequent is Alex's lemonade stand which is alsf.org, I believe. And they are a really, really well-organized group uh, raising funding for pediatric cancer. And um, I think we have raised something on the order of 70 grand now for them, maybe more than that, over the course of, of these races. We actually do, though, we do Speedway Children's Charities at some events. We do Alex's Lemonade Stand. We have uh, Vox United, which does water projects in Africa. So we always try to pick something that's that uh, has a local representative who can come and kind of work the crowds. There's a lot of ways to raise money for things like that through racing. You can obviously solicit donations. You can solicit lap-by-lap lap donations. You can make people buy their way out of the penalty box if they screw up. It's a, it's a great venue for raising funds for something that's a little more useful than just driving around in circles like a bunch of idiots. So... Alex's has been a great partner in that they're super enthusiastic. The people they send to work and do the fundraising at the races are always, um, you know, they're always right there in it. And I think it's been a good relationship. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah they're definitely a worthwhile charity. We raised uh, $5,000 at the Thunder Hill race for them. And, yeah. Uh, well, that's yeah. just incredible. Yeah, in, in one whack. In one whack, yeah. Wow, that's terrific. So, uh, Jay, any closing thoughts? You know, we are making this crap up as we go every day, and I am gratified that you you guys have been enjoying it. It is a huge surprise to us every time we put on a race and people show up and they seem to keep showing up. We're just sort of pleasantly stunned. So, you know, thanks for showing up. Yeah, pleasantly stunned is good. I mean, I'd say that's the reaction that a lot of people have when they see half the cars that uh, yeah. come out of the gate. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. But I I still lean on horrified. Well, well, Jay, you know, horrified or not, or just goofing around and everything, I can tell you as a guy that's that's been overseas and and, and shot at and blew it up a whole lot, what you've created has given me a reason to stay here and avoid the temptation to go and and earn a big paycheck and put myself in harm's way because, damn, I love racing. So you've made a difference, and and at least as far as I'm concerned, you you make a difference for uh, for veterans and everything. I know we've had a number of teams come out and do that. So for all of us service members, thank you. Wounded Warrior has been our beneficiary before and and well I, I really appreciate that that means a lot to me thank you um i'm uh, i i don't know what to say about that but you know keep showing up it's dangerous over there stick around with us for a while <laughs> hey i hope you come back on the show sometime uh sometime soon and maybe we can recap the season or do whatever you Good want and our welcome mats out for you i'd love it and anytime just let me know i'd love to come back terrific great time jay thanks thank you a lot. jay thanks guys bye-bye bye-bye, bye-bye. bye-bye.